Hello there everyone and welcome back to the Mr. Sin channel. Today we are going to review practice three, data interpretation. That's right, the time has come to talk about data and math. Now it won't be that bad, but to make sure that you can follow along and keep track of everything in the video, make sure you get my guided notes. I created them to help you remember the important concepts in this video. Remember from our last video, we have two types of data quantitative and qualitative. Quantitative data is numbers, facts, information that is not up for interpretation. For example, if you took AP Human Geography, you heard me talk about how quantitative data can come from the census, such as the population of a city or the medium income of a town. These are facts and they're not up for debate. While on the other hand, qualitative data is often found in word form and comes from surveys, interviews, and is up for interpretation. Qualitative data describes qualities or characteristics of something. For example, how would you rate the food at your school lunch? Or how good of a job do you think the president is doing? Now that was just a quick overview of these two concepts. If you do need more help with them, check out the free practice quiz in my ultimate review packet. So when looking at data, we need to understand the difference between descriptive statistics and inferential statistics. Descriptive statistics is when researchers organize and describe data. Here researchers are describing the data that is collected. While inferential statistics is when researchers make predictions about their data and the independent variables. Inferential statistics help researchers determine if the data from a sample can be applied to a population. Inferential statistics uses techniques to make generalizations about a population based on the sample of data. These statistics help researchers test a hypothesis and provide insight into the results of a study to help determine if there was bias in the study or if the results are statistically significant. Remember, a hypothesis is a specific prediction about the relationship between variables. And actually, since I mentioned a hypothesis, I do want to point out that there's two different types of a hypothesis that you'll want to be familiar with when looking at data. The first hypothesis is the null hypothesis, which is a claim that there is no effect or difference between the variables. This often serves as the baseline for testing. Now, the second is the alternative hypothesis, which claims that there is an effect or difference between the variables. This is often what the study or researcher is seeking to show. When testing a hypothesis, hypothesis, you'll need to look at the p-value, which lucky for AP Psychology, you don't have to worry about calculating, but you do need to understand how to interpret it. The p-value provides insight into the statistical significance of a study's results. It can range anywhere from zero to one. This is what lets researchers know if they should accept or reject the null hypothesis. If a p-value is less than or equal to 0.05, the results of the study are statistically significant, which means the results of the study were most likely not caused by chance or luck. So a p-value of 0.03 would mean that we would reject the null hypothesis and accept the alternative hypothesis, meaning that the variables are most likely connected. The smaller the p-value, the stronger the evidence is against the null hypothesis, and the more likely it is that the results are statistically significant. While on the other hand, the larger the p-value, the more likely it is that the results of the experiment were due to chance or luck. For instance, a p-value of 0.90 would mean that there is a 90% chance that the results were due to chance or luck. So we should reject the alternative hypothesis and accept the null hypothesis. If you want more practice with the null and alternative hypothesis and interpreting p-values, check out the exclusive practice problems inside my ultimate review packet. One other concept you need to be familiar with when interpreting results is effect size, which tells us the strength of the relationship between variables. Unlike the p-value, effect size tells us how meaningful the effect is in real-world terms. For instance, in a study comparing two groups, a large effect size means there is a substantial difference between the groups, while a small effect size indicates a more minor difference. Let's say that we are looking at the results of a study that was examining whether a therapy reduces anxiety. The p-value of the study is 0.05, which tells us that the therapy likely has an effect since the results are statistically significant. At the same time, we see that the effect size for the study is small, which tells us that while the therapy does most likely reduce anxiety, the improvement may be minimal in practical terms. When remembering the difference between effect 
effect size and statistical significance, just remember that effect size tells us how big or meaningful the difference or relationship is in a study, while statistical significance tells us whether that difference is likely real or just due to chance. So statistical significance shows us if the results matter, and effect size shows us how much they matter in real life. All right, now let's go back to descriptive statistics and look at different ways in which researchers can display data, starting with a frequency distribution table, which allows them to see how often sets of data occur. For example, when looking at this frequency distribution table, which is displaying quiz scores, I can see that three students got a 6, one student got a 10, and two students got a 5. Now, researchers will also utilize a frequency polygon as a visual representation of a frequency distribution table, which highlights the different connections between points on a scatter plot. Another tool that can be used is a histogram, which is another way in which researchers display data. Histograms are bar graphs that show frequencies through vertical columns. These are very similar to bar graphs. However, they are different in the fact that a histogram does not have space between the bars, while a bar graph does have space between each bar. Lastly, researchers could display data in a pie chart, where data is divided into sections of a circle, each representing a proportion of the whole. Honestly, the most important part here is that you can interpret data, regardless of how it's presented, since you for sure will have to do this on your unit test and that AP national exam. So to help you practice, I created different test questions that look at studies and data. This way you can practice the skill before you're actually assessed. You can check it out in my ultimate review packet today. Just click the link in the description below and sign up for the free preview. All right, now comes the time to switch gears and get into the real fun, which is math. Once researchers have organized their data, they need to summarize it, and it starts with the mode, median, and mean, also known as the central tendency. The mean is the average of the data set. To find this, you would take the sum of all of the values and then divide it by the amount of values you added together. Now, before we go on to mode, I want to draw your attention to the fact that as more data is collected, we will start to see a regression towards the mean occur. A regression toward the mean happens when outliers, such as very high high or very low results are followed by results that are closer to the average. For instance, let's say you play basketball and you usually score around 15 points per game, but tonight you have an amazing game and you end up scoring 30 points. This is most likely due to your skill, but also luck. Over the next few games, you start to go back to scoring 15 points a game. This is an example of regression to the mean. We can see that your outlier game was probably most likely influenced by luck, such as the other team not playing well. And as we continue to have more games, your typical performance came back. Regression to the mean can also occur if you are below the mean. For instance, if I played another game of basketball and only scored five points, it's likely that the next game my luck would improve and I would score closer back to the mean. We can see that the more extreme the outlier, the more regression is likely to occur. All right, that's enough talk about the mean. Let's now move on to the mode. To find the mode, you want to look at the value that occurs most often. Whichever value occurs the most is the mode. Lastly, for the median, you want to find the score that is in the exact middle of the data set. To find the median, you need to organize your data in order of smallest to largest. If you have an odd number of values, you take the value that is in the middle. And if you have an even amount of values, then you add up the two values in the middle and divide by two. So the central tendency does a great job at providing us with a snapshot of the data that was collected. But we cannot really gauge how the data is dispersed. To do that, we need to look at the measures of variability with range and standard deviation. To calculate the range, you need to take the highest value point and the lowest value point and subtract them. Range is just the difference between the two points. For example, if we go back to our original set of data, the highest value is 210 and the lowest is 95. So our range is 115. Standard deviation, on the other hand, allows researchers to indicate the average distance from the mean for a data set. For AP Psychology, you don't have to worry about having to calculate the standard deviation. Now, when looking at the standard deviation, we can see a couple different distributions occur. Sometimes we might have a normal distribution. This takes the shape with a symmetrical bell-shaped curve. 
here we have just one mode, and the mean, median, and mode are located at the center of the distribution, at the zero point value. A normal distribution is not the most common frequency distribution. It is much more common that data will have a positive skew or a negative skew. Positive skew occurs when scores are low and clustered to the left of the mean, while a negative skew has the highest scores clustered on the right of the mean. You also might see a bimodal distribution, which is when a distribution has two modes, causing the distribution to have two peaks. If you feel like you need more practice with distributions, measures of variability, or central tendency, you can go through the practice problems in my ultimate review packet. I know I keep referencing these extra resources, but it is because I want to make sure that you are practicing these concepts. It is not enough just to listen to me talk in a video. You need to practice. Trust me, if you practice and use different quizzes and tests, it'll definitely go better for you in class. Now, while you might not have to calculate the standard deviation, you do need to be able to understand what it means and be able to analyze different distributions and data. In a normal distribution, on average, 68% of scores will fall within one standard deviation of the mean in each direction. 95% of scores will fall within two standard deviations of the mean in each direction, and 99% of scores will fall within three standard deviations of the mean in each direction. Speaking of standard deviation, you also want to be familiar with z-scores and percentiles. The z-score is a numerical measurement that describes how many standard deviations a particular score is from the average or mean. We can see in a normal distribution a positive z-score is higher than the mean, and a negative z-score indicates the score is lower than the mean. Generally, z-scores allow us to compare things that are not the same, as long as they are normally distributed. On the other hand, percentile rank is the percentage of scores at or below a particular score. Essentially, this tells you what percentage of the population has a score or value that's the same or lower than yours, which can be calculated in a normal distribution. When interpreting percentile ranks, remember that the median is the 50th percentile. This means that half the data falls above it and half below it. Look at an example of percentile rank to make sure it's making sense. Say you went to the doctor and you find out that you are in the 73rd percentile for height. This means that 73% of people your age are shorter than or equal in height to you, while 27% of people your age are as tall or taller than you. All right, let's see if this is making sense. Take five seconds and try to answer the problem on the screen. If you need more time, you can always pause the video. And that's time. Hopefully your head is not spinning right now. To check your answers, you can go down to the comment section of this video and look for my answers on the top. If you do want more practice at interpreting the percentile rank and z-scores, you can find extra practice problems in my ultimate review packet. Now, to make sure that this is making sense, I also included explanations for each problem to help make sure you're fully understanding everything. And just like that, we made it to our last topic, which is coefficients. And when talking about coefficients, we also have to talk about correlational studies, which remember, these studies seek to determine the relationship between two variables. Correlations allow us to make predictions on what might happen in a study. But again, remember, correlation does not mean causation. Now, a coefficient between 0 and 1 indicates that as one variable increases, the other also increases. This is known as a positive correlation or positive relationship, which when plotted on a scatter plot would appear as an upward trend. On the other hand, a correlation coefficient between 0 and negative 1 indicates that as one variable increases, the other decreases, showing an inverse relationship. This is known as a negative correlation or negative relationship, which when plotted on a scatter plot would appear as a downward trend. Lastly, if there is no correlation, it means there is no relationship between the variables, and the data points on the scatter plot will be scattered randomly. All right, by now it should really come as no surprise, but I did create some extra resources to help you practice interpreting the results of correlational studies. You can find the correlational practice quiz and explanations in my ultimate review packet. And just like that, we're on to the practice quiz. See, the math wasn't that bad. Now take some time and answer the questions on the screen and check your answers in the comment section down below. Also, don't forget to check out the Mr. Sin Discord server and consider subscribing. As always, I'm Mr. Sin. Thank you so much for watching. And until next time, I'll see you online.